Let's review some questions for rheumatology. So question one, a 61-year-old woman presents to your clinic complaining of dry eyes and a dry mouth for the past few months. She said she had attributed it to seasonal allergies, but is now concerned that it's lasted this long. Her medical history includes hypertension, for which she is well controlled with lisinopril. On physical exam, the buccal mucosa appears dry, the conjunctiva are injected bilaterally, and there is my mild bilateral enlargement of the parotid glands. Which of the following is the best first step in the management of this patient? Is it A, parotid gland biopsy, B, Schirmer test and anti-Rho anti-law titers, C, prednisone, D, MRI, or E, referral to ophthalmology? And as usual, I'll give you time to pause. And the answer is B, Schirmer test and anti-Rho anti-law titers. So this is a patient that likely has Sjogren's syndrome, and Sjogren's syndrome is a disease of, uh, of, of the lacrimal ducts and of the, uh, of the salivary glands. So the way that we will uh, start the diagnostic management is with a Schirmer test. And what the Schirmer test is, is it's just a uh, paper that you place underneath the uh, inferior uh, fold of the eye and then uh, you see how much uh, you let the patient close their eyes uh, and for five minutes and you see how much tears uh, inundate the paper and if it's five millimeters or less then that's a positive Schirmer test and then at that point you'll get anti row and anti law titers which are specific for Sjogren's syndrome. A parotid gland biopsy would not be necessary here. A parotid gland biopsy is the most accurate test for diagnosing Sjogren syndrome, but it is not necessary here because uh, uh, the, we're going to we have to establish a diagnosis uh, with a more convenient test. So a parotid gland biopsy would be done uh, afterwards, after we get a Schirmer test and anti rho anti law titers. Uh, they both come back positive. Okay, question two. A 27-year-old woman presents complaining of aching all over. She says that it has been slowly getting worse over the past years, and now it's beginning to affect her ability to function at work. She says she sleeps 8 to 10 hours per night, but never feels like she gets fully rested. On physical exam, there are no, no gross joint deformities, no swelling, and no bruising. Pain is elicited near the second intercostal spaces, the trapezius insertion, the occiput, the elbows, the hips, and the medial fat pad of the knees. CBC, CMP, and erythrocyte cementation rate are all within normal limits. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? Is it A, prednisone, B, serology for rheumatoid factor, C, indomethacin, D, hydroxychloroquine, or E, amitriptyline? And the answer here is E, amitriptyline. So amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant, and that's the best drug of choice in patients who have fibromyalgia. This patient has fibromyalgia because she has uh, several uh, of the uh, of the trigger points for fibromyalgia. As you can see here, there's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen trigger points for fibromyalgia. They're the same on either side, left and right. Uh, you have to have at least eleven of the sixteen trigger points for fibromyalgia. Let's see if I got them all in there. Two, four, six, eight, ten. 12. Okay, so I got, there's 12 of them here, so she fits the criteria for fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is pain for greater than or equal to 2 months, and then greater than or equal to 11 trigger points. So amitriptyline is the first step in uh, medical management, or any tricyclic antidepressant. Question three, a 37-year-old male presents to your clinic complaining of stuffy nose and wants a refill on his nasal mimetazone he has used for the past two years. He says that while the meds do not fully relieve his nose symptoms, that his symptoms are even worse without them. Physical exam reveals an indentation at the nasal bridge, faint by basal or crackles on auscultation, and a purpuric rash on his left ankle. Based on his presentation, which of the following is the most likely 
uh, is most likely the best therapy in the management of this patient. A, continue mometasone and add beta-methasone for the rash. B, infliximab. C, prednisone and cyclophosphamide. D, prednisone and methotrexate. Or E, albuterol and add beta-methasone for rash. <clears throat> so this is a patient who has Wagoner's granulomatosis. Uh, of course, we would have to do diagnostic tests before starting the patient on uh, prednisone and psych particularly cyclophosphamide. And what we would look for is we would look for a C anca, and then we would do a biopsy of the nasal uh, mucosa. So uh, the, the nasal biopsy would show uh, granulomas. But the best uh, therapy the best medical therapy in the management of the patient, not the best next step, the best therapy for the patient would be prednisone and cyclophosphamide. Uh, we can change the patient uh, to methotrexate after uh, they've been on cyclophosphamide and the disease goes into remission. That's usually about a year and a half, uh, but we have to start them with cyclophosphamide. Okay. So uh, same patient, and after formal diagnosis of Wigner's granulomatosis, he started on prednisone and cyclophosphamide. Which of the following medications should be added to his medication regimen? Is it A, azithromycin, B, doxycycline, C, gancyclovir, D, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, or E, daptomycin? The answer here is D, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So, this is a uh, flashback to microbiology, and what you should know is patients that are put on, uh, on cyclophosphamide are at risk to develop pneumocystis gyrovecchi pneumonia, pneumocystis carini pneumonia, PCP. And that's the same pneumonia that patients who have HIV AIDS, who are less than 200 uh, CD4 cells, uh, are at risk for. So we put them on the exact same prophylaxis, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. If the patient is allergic to sulfa drugs, you can use Dapsone, um, but uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is the drug of choice if the patient is not allergic to sulfa. Question five, a 32-year-old woman presents to the clinic complaining of stiffness in her arms that's been getting worse over the past few months. It's worsened on exertion. She's otherwise healthy and has no significant medical history. On physical exam, there are weak radial pulses bilaterally and a soft diastolic murmur over the right sternal border. Based on this patient's symptoms, which of the following is the most accurate test for diagnosis? A, titer for rheumatoid factor, B, MRI, C, angiography, D, arterial biopsy, or E, echocardiogram. And the answer here is C, angiography. So this is a patient uh, that has stiffness in her, in her arms. Now she's 32 years old. That is way too young to be getting stiff in the arms. Uh, and it's worsened on exertion. So that shows that this is an inflammatory pain this is claudication. So patients that are 32 years old should not be getting claudication anywhere. On physical exam, we note that there are weak radial pulses, and we also note a soft diastolic murmur. What does that point to? Well, radial pulses, when they're weak, means that there's not enough circulation getting to uh, that part of, of the circulation, or uh, that, there's, uh, that there's plaques. But uh, in this case, it's safe to assume that, uh, that the, there's a blockage, that there's, a, uh, there's weak flow to the radial artery. Uh, the soft diastolic murmur is indicative of the fact that there is a high pressure gradient that the left ventricle is pumping against. So a soft diast a diastolic murmur over the right sternal border would be indicative of aortic regurgitation. And so we have a high pressure gradient that we're pumping against. And what this is, is Takayasu's arteritis. Takayasu's arteritis is arteritis of the large arteries, uh, namely those coming off of the arch of the aorta. So since we have uh, blockage before the radial artery, that's why we're getting 
weak radial pulses and because we have blockage in general coming right off of the aorta, that's why we're getting a high pressure gradient which is causing the aortic regurgitation. And just the lessened blood flow in general is causing the claudication, low oxygen to the arm muscles. So the best, the most accurate test for diagnosing Takayasu's arteritis is angiography. Unlike most of the other arteri arterites, which uh, arterial biopsy is the most accurate test. In, uh, in Takayasu's arteritis, the arteries are just way too deep. Uh, so we go with angiography and it's easy to visualize the blockages. Question six, a 19 year old college football player complains of generalized back pain. He's concerned because it's been ongoing for the past two months and he hasn't seemed to get any better. That's a typo there. He notes that it is worst in the morning. He has no significant medical history besides testing positive last year for latent TB, for which he's presently on a nine month regimen of isoniazid. On physical exam, there is, a, uh, there is pain on bending over, but no spinal tenderness. There appears to be a mild loss of lumbar lordosis. Otherwise, the physical exam is unremarkable. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? A, lumbar spinal x-ray, B, prednisone, C, methotrexate, D, referral to physical therapy and stretching exercises, or E, MRI. And this is a real patient. And the answer is A, lumbar spinal x-ray. So in this case, you have uh, pain that's worse in the morning. It's lumbar pain. And so uh, anytime we think of pain that's worse in the morning, we think it's inflammatory. And this is indeed inflammatory. It is ankylosing spondylitis. So ankylosing spondylitis is a seronegative uh, spondyloarthropathy. There is, uh, that means that it's associated with uh, HLA-B27. And there is no... Uh, circulating antibody that's associated with this disease. So we have to go ahead and just get a lumbar spinal x-ray and that's actually going to be very indicative because there's very clear changes on the spinal x-ray. And I'll show you what that looks like. So here is the changes on the spinal x-ray and you can see that there's a fusion of the spinal processes. This is the lumbar spine here. And so there's a loss in lordosis because this normal curvature of the spinal bodies is lost to the fact that you basically have uh, this connection of the spinal processes which completely uh, obliterates that that nice lordosis you're supposed to have. And so these patients are at risk of fracture because you don't have that nice ability to flex uh, and extend the spine like you would uh, if, if you had that uh, lordosis. And so that causes pain uh, just by regular old movement. Okay, so same patient, lumbar spinal x-ray shows calcification along the spinal processes. Which of the following is the best medical management in this patient's disease process? Is it A, prednisone, B, sulfasalazine, C, diclofenac, D, hydromorphone, or E, acetaminophen? And the answer is diclofenac. So the best therapy for ankylosing spondylitis, the best initial therapy, is an NSAID. Okay, so a 47-year-old woman presents to your clinic complaining of joint pain over the past two months. The pain is worse in the morning. Her medical history includes type 1 diabetes mellitus and major depressive disorder. She's presently on insulin, sertraline, and fish oil supplement. On physical exam, there's swelling of the MCPs, PIPs, and wrists. They're warm and erythematous. Which of the following antibodies would be most specific to the condition most likely in this patient? Is it A, anti-Rho, B, anti-SCL70, C, anti-JO1, D, C, ANCA, or E, rheumatoid factor? And the answer here is rheumatoid factor. So uh, this patient is likely to most likely to have rheumatoid arthritis based on the fact that she's got uh, swelling in her MCPs, PIPs, and wrists, rheumatoid factor, notoriously spares the distal uh, interphalangeal joints. Uh, so uh, anti-Rho is associated with um, 
is most uh, most notoriously associated uh, with Sjogren's syndrome. Anti SCL seventy is associated with scleroderma. Anti Jo one is associated with uh, some forms of polymyositis and dermatomyositis. And C anca is associated with many different syndromes, particularly Wegener's granulomatosis. Okay, question nine. A 44-year-old man presents to the clinic complaining of pain and swelling. He was married last year and is upset because his wedding ring no longer fits. His medical history includes 20 pack years smoking and a BMI of 29. Uh, in physical exam, there is a mild plus two over six systolic murmur over the apex, clear lung sounds, and noticeable swelling of the digits bilaterally. There is also a goldish white plaque beneath four of his nail beds, which he notes a previous doctor gave him terbinafine, but it did not clear the discoloration. Which of the following is the best initial therapy in the management of this patient? A. Indomethacin, B. Methotrexate, C. Sulfasalazine, D. Indomethacin and Methotrexate, or E. Indomethacin and Sulfasalazine. And the answer here is D, indomethacin and methotrexate. So this is a patient who has psoriatic arthritis. And for psoriatic arthritis, we uh, will we need to treat the pain and we need to treat the inflammation. Uh, we need to treat the, uh, the source of the disease. Uh, so indomethacin is an NSAID that's useful for the arthritic symptoms. And then methotrexate uh, treats the, uh, the inflammatory process itself, the, uh, the psoriatic arthritis. So uh, if, this, if methotrexate is not sufficient, then uh, you can use a biologic such as Enbrel or a Tanercept. Now, uh, you know that this is psoriatic arthritis. Even though the patient doesn't have the typical skin symptoms of psoriasis, you can have psoriasis underneath the nail beds, and that's highly associated with psoriatic arthritis because it's affecting the hands. And uh, psoriasis underneath the nails is a, just a goldish white plaque and it can be very easily misdiagnosed as, uh, as, as uh, fungal nail disease, and so that makes sense that a previous doctor gave him terbinafine. Okay, question 10. A 51-year-old woman presents to your clinic complaining of difficulty swallowing. She says she constantly needs to drink water while eating food to get the food down. She was previously sent to a gastroenterologist who performed an EGD. The EGD report notes no structural abnormalities. However, there were two small vascular proliferations noted on the esophageal mucosa. She is otherwise healthy. On physical exam, you note five painless nodules on her right digits. The, exam, uh, the hands are cool to touch. Uh, the skin of the fingers are firm. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? A, ANA titer, B, rheumatoid factor titer, C, anti-SCL70 titer, D, x-ray of the hands, or E, esophageal manometry. Right. And the answer here is A, ANA titer. So what are we looking for? Well, first off, what is this? Uh, this is Crest syndrome. Crest syndrome is C-R-E-S-T, so C is calcinosis, and that would be the the painless nodules in the skin. Uh, R is Raynaud's syndrome. So Raynaud's syndrome, we don't necessarily see here, but we see hints of what might be uh, Raynaud's syndrome uh, in that the uh, hands are cool to touch. Raynaud's syndrome is just simply a decreased circulation uh, to the hands, and particularly we see uh, a uh, discoloration when uh, the hands are cold. E is uh, esophageal dysfunction, and so that would be uh, the dysphagia that the patient has. Uh, it can also manifest in GERD. Uh, S is scleroderma, so uh, particularly sclerodactyly, and so this would be uh, the skin of the fingers being firm. And T is telangiectasia, and telangiectasia are just vascular proliferations, and that's what was noted on the EGD. So this is Crest syndrome, and the antibody that's associated with Crest syndrome is anti-centromere antibody, which is an ANA. So uh, you should remember that anti-centromere antibody it falls under the class of ANA. So it's an ANA titer. 
Okay, a 48-year-old man presents to the ED complaining of sudden onset right knee pain that woke him from his sleep. On physical exam, the right knee is visibly erythematous and swollen, warm, tender, and fluctuant. Arthrocentesis is performed and shows negatively birefringent needle-shaped crystals. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? A. Colchicine, B. Allopurinol, C. Probenicid, D. Indomethacin, or E. Fabuxostat? You should know immediately that when you've got a joint that's erythematous, swollen, warm, tender, and fluctuant, that the next best step is arthrocentesis. But we already did that here. So what's, what's the next step now that we've got the negatively birefringent crystals? And it's D, indomethacin. We treat the pain first. This is gout. You should know gout inside and out. Gout is uh, sudden onset pain, it's inflammatory joint pain, uh, and uh, it tends to happen in older men. So we treat the pain first, and then as a chronic basis on long-term therapy, we treat uh, the, the uric acid levels. Now, there's a couple things I want you to remember. One, when you want to diagnose gout, you got to do an arthrocentesis. Do not get a uric acid level. Uric acid is high in gout but the uric acid levels uh, do not correlate to gout uh, flares. So patients with gout tend to have high uric acid levels, but those uric acid levels don't go up significantly when they're having flares of gout. So uric acid level won't tell you anything on the patient. You need to get an arthrocentesis. And we treat the pain first, and then on a long-term basis, we treat their, uh, their uric acid levels. Now, colchicine or allopurinol would be the first drug that we would use to treat the uric acid level. Probenicid would be a drug that we would use for patients who are under secretors. So any patient with gout, it could be useful to get a 24-hour uric acid secretion test. And if they're under secretors, then you can put them on probenicid, which will increase their secretion of uric acid. And that would be in addition to the colchicine or allopurinol. Colchicine has a uh, really, really bad GI upset effect. It causes diarrhea. So I prefer not to have patients on colchicine. Allopurinol, in my opinion, is the, uh, is the superior drug for, uh, for decreasing the synthesis of uric acid. But either or are fine. They're both xanthase oxidase inhibitors. Uh, xanthine oxidase inhibitors, rather. Um, so, like I said, though, d indomethacin is the right answer because we treat the pain first, and then, on a long-term basis, we treat the uric acid, uh, sec uric acid production slash secretion. Fibuxostat is also known uh, and marketed as Euloric. That's another drug that could be used either in addition or in substitution uh, to A, B, or C. But we have to treat the pain. A 67-year-old woman complains of pain in her jaw when she eats. The pain radiates up to her ear. Her medical history includes type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and prophylactic double mastectomy 10 years ago. Her meds include captopril, hydrochlorothiazide, metformin, and aspirin. Physical exam includes scalp pain, a visible firm artery over her forehead, and mild tenderness of the shoulder and thighs. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? A. Naproxen, B. Prednisone, C. Temporal artery biopsy, D. CRP levels, or E. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate. CRP being C-reactive protein. And the answer is E. ESR. So this is a patient who has jaw claudication. Jaw claudication means you're not getting claudication means you're not getting enough oxygen to the muscle and so you're getting pain. Uh, it's like jaw angina. It's kind of like the same thing we saw in the patient with Takayasu's arteritis who had the arm claudication. This patient has a, uh, a, an arteritis of the temporal artery. Uh, really though it could be arteritis of any of the, uh, of the offshoots of the external uh, carotid artery. So the jaw claudication is indicative, also that firm artery over the forehead, that's the inflamed temporal artery, uh, superficial temporal artery, rather. Uh, the scalp pain is another symptom of temporal arteritis, and then mild tenderness of shoulder and thighs. What's that? That's not a sign of temporal arteritis, but that is a sign of polymyalgia rheumatica. 
And polymyalgia rheumatica is present in around 50% of patients with, uh, with temporal arteritis. So that just happens to be there hitching along. Uh, but the first step in any patient where you suspect temporal arteritis is to get an erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate will, uh, will, if it's negative, it pretty much rules out temporal arteritis. But if it's positive, uh, then you're going to treat. Okay, ESR is drawn and is 45. The normal is 38, less than 38. How do you know that? Just by the way, you take the age. If it's a woman, you add 10 and you divide it by 2. That's the normal erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Which of the following is the next best step? A, naproxen, B, prednisone, C, temporal artery biopsy, D, ophthalmology referral, or E, methotrexate. So we have an elevated ESR in this patient. And the answer is B, prednisone. So as soon as we get an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate in a patient where we suspect temporal arteritis, we treat the patient with prednisone. Yes, we're going to get a temporal artery biopsy. Yes, that is the most accurate test in diagnosing temporal arteritis. However, we treat the patient after the ESR, and then we're also going to be getting the temporal artery biopsy. But these patients are in pain, so we have to get the prednisone in to help deal with the pain, and then we get a temporal artery biopsy. That's just the sequence and how it goes. So you suspect temporal arteritis, you get your ESR, ESR is high, treat with prednisone, and then subsequently you get your temporal artery biopsy. Question 14, a 67-year-old woman, okay, this is the same patient, sorry. Uh, this patient is at increased risk to develop which of the following disease processes? Oh, shoot, I already told you this. I always do this. Okay, so this is not really a question here. This patient is at increased risk to develop which of the following disease processes? A, polymyositis, B, dermatomyositis, C, polymyalgia rheumatica, D, osteoarthritis, or E, fibromyalgia. So you kind of already see it in the mild tenderness of the shoulder and thighs. She's already got it. It's polymyalgia rheumatica. So patients who, are at, who have temporal arteritis are at risk for polymyalgia rheumatica and vice versa. So remember the association between temporal arteritis and polymyalgia rheumatica. Plus they're both diseases of the elderly. And they're both treated with prednisone as well. So kill two birds with one stone. Okay, 23 year old woman presents with generalized joint pain. You immediately notice erythema over her cheekbones. Physical exam is otherwise unremarkable. She has a past medical history of epilepsy which she takes levetiracetam and phenytoin. CBC and CMP are drawn, sodium-139, potassium-4.1, chloride-106, bicarb-24, BUN-17, creatinine-1.3, glucose-116, white blood cell count-3.5, hemoglobin-10.3, hematocrit-31, platelets-415. Which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient? A, ANA, anti-Smith and anti-DSDNA titers. B, anti-histone titers. C, discontinue phenytoin. D, start IV methylprednisolone. Or E, renal biopsy. Now, what you pause it here. Okay, so what do we have here? We've got a patient who's got uh, high platelets, so that's indicative of an inflammatory process because it's an acute phase reactant. Um, she's got a low white blood cell count, which may be indicative of a different process going on here, but we don't necessarily know that. Um, and uh, so she's got a malar rash, and she's got epilepsy, this patient is most likely to have lupus. And so the titers we're going to want to have are ANA, anti-Smith, and anti-DSDNA titers. Now I put in here phenytoin. Why phenytoin? Because phenytoin can cause drug-induced lupus. That's not the same as lupus. Remember, what, do we, what helps us differentiate lupus from drug-induced lupus? Lupus, the real lupus, has the malar rash or uh, a discoid rash. Drug-induced lupus does not. So even though she's on phenytoin, she has real lupus. 
And epilepsy, neuropsychiatric symptoms can be uh, can stem from lupus. They can be in that constellation. So we are going to get the anti-Smith, anti-DSDNA, and ANA titers. Antihistone titers would be what we would want if we suspected drug-induced lupus, which we don't because she's got a Malar rash. Discontinued phenytoin would be what we would do if we diagnosed drug-induced lupus here, and then the other two are wrong. Okay, question 16. A 23-year-old woman presents with generalized joint pain. You immediately notice erythema over her cheekbones. What am I talking about? This is the same patient. Okay, I should have bold-faced and italicized this, just so I can remember myself. Okay, so you got the same woman here. She's uh, diagnosed with lupus. Uh, she's well-controlled on methotrexate. Three years later, she presents to your office at two months gestation, which this is her first pregnancy. She's already stopped methotrexate at the advice of her knowledgeable OBGYN. Which of the following labs would you be most interested in ordering if you're her rheumatologist or her internist treating her lupus? Is it A, anti-JO1, B, ESR, C, anti-RO, D, anti-LAW, or E, C, ANCA? And the answer here is C, anti-RO. So patients who have lupus are at increased risk for having their children have congenital lupus, neonatal lupus. And neonatal lupus just happens because circulating maternal antibodies get passed down to the fetus. And so it's actually the anti-Rho antibodies that cause neonatal lupus. So as a result of that, and there is anti-Rho in lupus, even though that's not the antibody that we necessarily uh, associate with lupus, it is present. It's just the anti-DSDNA and anti-Smith are more associated. Uh, they're more specific. But there is anti-Rho in lupus. Um, so with lupus, we want to check anti-Rho because we know then uh, if the patient's going to be at increased risk for delivering a, uh, a baby with neonatal lupus. So we can have uh, those neonatologists already and primed when uh, mom is delivering. And what's the other disorder? that is prone to, de uh, to deliver with neonatal lupus, and that would be Sjogren's syndrome. And that's because Sjogren's syndrome has anti-Rho and anti-Law, and those are actually more, uh, those are more, uh, I would say, more of the correlated antibodies to Sjogren's syndrome. So remember, neonatal lupus in association with lupus and Sjogren's syndrome. And here's a couple of babies with neonatal lupus. This one here on the left has a discoid pattern rash, and this one here on, uh, on the left, patient's left, so your left, this one's on the right, uh, has a malar rash. Both are neonatal lupus. Babies shouldn't be getting regular old SLE. Question 17. 52-year-old woman presents to your clinic complaining of weakness. She says over the past several months she's had a harder time brushing her hair, reaching for high objects, and lifting her 12-month-old granddaughter. There is no rash. CPK and aldolase levels are elevated. She undergoes a muscle biopsy, which shows lymphocytic infiltration in the endometrial spaces. She started on prednisone. Which of the following would you tell this patient? A, this is a life-threatening condition. B, avoid exposure to sunlight. C, breathing problems can come with this condition. Please return if you feel frequent shortness of breath. D, your condition is genetic and your daughter has a 50% chance of inheriting it. Or E, visual deficits are common with this condition, so please be in touch with your optometrist. The answer here is C, breathing problems can come with this condition, so please return if you feel frequent shortness of breath. This is a patient with polymyositis. She doesn't have a rash. We would expect a heliotrope rash if we wanted to diagnose dermatomyositis. And remember, the heliotrope rash is just sort of that blushing rash uh, that you get uh, in your eyelids and your cheek and your face. Uh, it also comes over sun-exposed areas. It kind of looks like a sunburn. So uh, she's got CPK and aldolase levels that are high. That's uh, an indicator of muscle inflammation. And then the muscle biopsy, which is performed after the CPK and aldolase levels come back uh, elevated, clearly shows that there is uh, inflammation of the muscle, which is causing the weakness. So um, important to remember that uh, the difference between 
polymyalgia rheumatica and polymyositis or dermatomyositis is that polymyalgia rheumatica is a disorder of pain and uh, polymyositis is going to be weakness. So uh, it's important though to remember that, uh, that dysphagia and uh, interstitial lung disease are associated with polymyositis and dermatomyositis. So it is possible that this patient could go on to develop interstitial lung disease. So if she starts to develop breathing prob problems or shortness of breath, she's gonna need to come back because we're gonna need to get an x-ray and see if there's any kind of interstitial uh, disease process going on. Okay, so same patient. Which of the following labs would you be interested in ordering? A, spirometry, B, chest x-ray, C, pulmonary biopsy, D, anti-JO1, or E, anti-RO? Same patient. And the answer here is D, anti-JO1. So patients with polymyositis or dermatomyositis are at risk for interstitial lung disease. The marker anti-JO1 is actually a marker that will tell you if they're at even more increased risk for interstitial lung disease. So patients who are anti-JO1 negative are at slightly less risk than the average polymyositis patient. Patients who are positive for anti jo one are at, at relatively greater risk than the average polymyositis patient. So you want to have the anti jo one profile on the polymyositis patient so you can keep a vigilant eye on, uh, on whether or not they're developing interstitial lung disease. It's good to know. So that's the lab you're going to be interested in ordering. anti jo one is associated with polymyositis and dermatomyositis. Spirometry and chest x-ray would be something that we would do if the patient had shortness of breath. So if she already had the polymyositis and we diagnosed it and, uh, and now she's coming in with shortness of breath, then spirometry uh, would be good to diagnose that it is an interstitial pattern and then chest x-ray would be good to visualize it. And then of course a pulmonary biopsy would be necessary to, uh, to pathologically determine uh, the interstitial lung disease. And anti-RO I just put in because it sounds like anti jo one Okay, 24-year-old man presents to the clinic complaining of a sore on his penis. He denies sexual contact. He has no significant medical history. On physical exam, you know, it's circular to ovio ovoid excoriations on the glans penis. Two three centimeter yellow gray indurations on the left shin and red injected eyes. He has also sores in his mouth, which he says he gets often. Which of the following is the best medical treatment in the management of this patient? A, prednisone, B, prednisone and methotrexate, D, or C, prednisone and azithromycin, D, prednisone and rituximab, or E, prednisone and sulfasalazine. And the answer here is B, prednisone and methotrexate. So what does this patient have? He's got sores on his penis. He's got these indurations, kind of grayish colored indurations on his shin. That sounds like erythema nodosum. Red injected eyes is, uh, sounds like uveitis. So uh, with uveitis, erythema nodosum, sores on the uh, wee wee, um, that is a, uh, a uh, many symptoms that are associated with Bissette syndrome and also the, uh, the canker sores. So that he has Bissette syndrome, we're going to treat that with steroids and a cytotoxic. So prednisone and methotrexate. Okay, 20, a 41 year old man presents to the clinic with numbness and tingling of his fingers. His medical history includes asthma, seasonal allergies, and GERD. His current meds are albuterol, mimetazone, loratadine, and omeprazole. On physical exam, his skin has a mottled lacy appearance and he has a small papular rash on his left forearm. There are bibasilar we uh, wheezes on auscultation. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? A. Wegener's granulomatosis, B. Microscopic vasculitis, C. Churg Strauss syndrome, D. Polyarteritis nodosa, or E. Crest syndrome. Okay, and the answer here is C, Churg-Strauss syndrome. So th that 
papular rash uh, is indicative of, uh, in the presence of other uh, indicative symptoms, is uh, points us towards a vasculitis. So that kind of helps us rule out Crest syndrome, and Crest syndrome is not likely because, well, there's really none of those symptoms here. So uh, when we're looking at our vasculitides, Wegener's granulomatosis, microscopic vasculitis, Churg Strauss, polyarteritis nodosa. Well, what do we know about uh, polyarteritis nodosa? We know it never has lung symptoms. This patient has asthma. So polyarteritis nodosa is out. Wagner's granulomatosis, uh, it uh, has more significant uh, nasal, uh, nasal symptoms, but what also does it not have? It doesn't have this neuropathy. That's very, that would be very, very unusual, uncharacteristic of Wegener's. Numbness and tingling, that, that, uh, that neuropathy, that is more indicative of Churg-Strauss syndrome or polyarteritis nodosa. And so since we know that it's got lung involvement, which polyarteritis nodosa never has, then we can say it's Churg-Strauss syndrome. Um, of course, we're not going to diagnose this. We're not going to ever diagnose Church-Strauss syndrome on, uh, on symptoms alone. We're going to diagnose it with a biopsy. So uh, this is just what's the most likely diagnosis, not what's the definitive diagnosis. Most likely out of these five choices. Okay, so same patient. Based on his symptoms, what of the following is the most is most likely the best medical therapy for this patient. A prednisone, B prednisone and cyclophosphamide, C prednisone, cyclophosphamide and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, D pregabalin or E prednisone and pregabalin. And the answer here is prednisone. Surprise! I bet you thought B or C. With Churg-Strauss syndrome, traditionally, we do not have to treat with a cytotoxic. So Churg-Strauss syndrome is uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit less severe than Wegener's granulomatosis. So with Wegener's, we treat with prednisone, cyclophosphamide, and then trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole uh, for PCP prophylaxis. Uh, but for uh, for uh, for Church Strauss, we uh, unless it's extremely severe, the patient's got uh, has got organ failure, like uh, like renal failure or um, something more severe, which he does not here. Then we don't need to treat with a cytotoxic. So Church Strauss can be treated with prednisone alone in non-severe cases. Uh, pregabalin may be useful, but uh, it's not indicated necessarily. So prednisone is the correct answer here.